Okay, hi. Thank you so much for waiting um, so long for, uh, for this talk. You made it and then you had to wait. I apologize. I'll try to go a little faster because you know, it's, it's the end of the day. Um, I want to talk about innovating in open source in your enterprise. And uh, this, is, this is a topic I know absolutely nothing about. But one of the directors I work with at AWS kept saying that uh, they wanted enterprises that we work with in open search to innovate in open search. And so I, I was like, I don't, I don't know anything about it. I'm just an open source developer. I go contribute code to a bunch of open source code. I know nothing about innovation, but I'll find out. I'll do some research and find out what this, this innovation is about. So this is, this is what this talk is about. But uh, before that, in case you missed the announcement, uh, we launched the open source, open search software foundation yesterday. It's a big deal. Um, and you know, I worked, I helped, worked on the team that helped with, uh, with getting this set up. And uh, we started seriously working on it around April. So uh, it's, been, it's been a long journey. And I think um, these foundations, including this one, will really create an open playing field for participants with very different views to build awesome software together. So I'm really excited about that. But I'm also excited about that because um, the, if you know, if, when, when we did the research for the foundations, we, of the foundations, we looked at many. And there are some awesome software foundations out there. Clip Software Foundation, Open Infra, Apache Software Foundation, et cetera. So I wanted to learn more about those as well and uh, read a lot about how they, how they were structured, what they could do, how they would enable our project to be, uh, to be great. But I was, I was secretly thinking that maybe Linux Foundation was going to be that foundation. Because if you notice, the logo color scheme uh, matches <laughs> quite, quite closely. And, you think, it's, you think it's funny, but the, the thing is that I own the Joseph Albers work that's on the right there. It's a print from 1968, signed, signed by Joseph Albers, a very famous uh, German-American artist. And um, that print has the same color scheme, too. And Joseph Albers wrote a book called Interaction of Color about looking at colors in a different way, uh, trying to, to teach us how to look at color. And this is a transformative book that was taught in all the art schools for, for a generation. And so every time I would look at different foundations, I would also look up from my computer and see this work above my desk in, in, my, in my home office and secretly think maybe, maybe we'll, we'll just have a coordinated color scheme for, for, for all these logos. I mean, look at it. It's, it's, a, it's, a perfect, it's really a perfect match. Uh, I think Linux Foundation is going to be an amazing home for open search. I'm so excited about being part of this journey and what, and, and what is to follow. Um, and what is to follow, I think, is a lot of innovation. Now, um, what, what, what is it? What is all this innovation? Uh, to me, I think when, if, you can, if you can solve a problem in some, in some new way for someone, then that is innovation. If someone comes to you and says, I have, I have a need, I have a problem, I don't know what to do about it, and you can successfully solve it for them, in our case with technology, then you can call yourself, in an, some, that you've you can say you've introduced some innovation to your product. In some ways, a successful project will be often an innovative project because it solves a problem for a user, a customer, uh, in some new way. And Interestingly, people are willing to adopt your product if you can solve something in a new way. They're willing to pay money to companies if uh, you can solve a particular problem that they had in a new innovative way. And then you can look back at the growing, pro at the growing product and maybe your growing business and use innovation as a measure of success. And if you cannot solve a problem for a customer in an innovative way, someone else will. Someone else will go and do it, and people will migrate from product to product and uh, use something else, because they always, they always have options. So remembering that, let's look at the innovation that was happening in the history of open search. Now, open search is based on Lucene. And to give Elastic, the company who spent a lot of effort uh, in Lucene for many years, some, uh, some credit, a lot of the early innovation in this technology was happening in Lucene, which is Apache Lucene, an open source project that has been 
it's, its very first innovation is to be able to write a search engine in pure Java. And then Elasticsearch connected a lot of these Lucene's in the distributed system and became a search engine that could scale to workloads that were not possible on one machine. Um, the, a lot of the innovation after Elasticsearch was developed um, was, was done in some proprietary code bases. So some features of Elasticsearch were not available in open source. Some features that were pretty basic, like security, uh, maybe vector search, some interesting ones. But then the engine was open source. And there was an open source version of the distribution that only included alternatives that were open source. That was called Open Distro for Elasticsearch. And that had some, some innovations in it, notably vector search, that was done in a very different way. It was not based on Lucene, but was based on other libraries like MSLib and, uh, and, and, and Face. Then finally, relicensing happens, and the fork happens. And for the first year of the fork, there was so much to do about just getting the software to release, package it together, just rename everything in the product itself to get to, uh, to open search that there wasn't that much innovation going on. But then finally, the product got stabler, and more users and more contributors came to the project. And uh, they started innovating in interesting ways. And I'll talk about what, what those are. So when people came to this, to this open, uh, open source project and wanted to innovate, um, I think they encountered what most of us encounter in when we try to contribute to, uh, in open source, uh, is that actually innovating in open source is harder. And it's, it's fairly logical. If you think of what are the enemies of innovation, one of the basic enemies is size. When you have you know, 100, 200, 500, 2,000 people contributing to one product or one project, you have to have these people agree in some way. And so a very easy way to agree is when you have very few people. You get them in a room, and they all agree. Startups innovate really fast, because they tend to be very small. And in a startup, you just have two, three people. They have an idea. They just go to it. They innovate. They go fast. In large companies, we try to create environments in which we can innovate by dividing the teams in self-contained units that have autonomy. And so we have like 10,000 startups, I used to say, that AWS is 10,000 startups. One team doesn't always depend from another, and so each of them can innovate in their own way. But size being an enemy of innovation, because very simply, communication has an overhead cost. It is much harder to do anything when you have to communicate to so many people and get their input and then do something about their input. So getting people. Uh, aligned on the same ideas is simply harder because when you have more people. And a successful open source project has more people. And so as we have more people, it gets harder and harder to innovate, in theory. However, when innovation in open source works, it actually produces tremendously better results. And the reason why it produces better results is because it forms some kind of consensus. So let's look at some examples. Some examples of successful open source projects that when they moved to some neutral place and were able to get a lot of people to agree on something, how they innovated. Look at PyTorch. I remember very well TensorFlow, and I remember PyTorch that was barely a thing. And then PyTorch moved to a foundation and thousands of people started innovating in PyTorch. And today, this is the default. It became a de facto standard. Another one is Apache Spark. When it was transferred to the Apache Software Foundation in 2013, it went something from like 20 contributors to 220. But Spark is universally accepted as a, as a tool, as something that we all like to use. It does tremendous things. So these are good examples of when, when it works in open source, it really works better because it creates the sum of different things. So if I take my work, if I take somebody else's work and another person's work, if we're able to add it up instead of competing with each other in one place, well, we get the sum of those things. Sometimes we even get the multiples of those things. And so these projects grow really fast and become really innovative because a lot of the features are built by lots of people. But the hard part is to agree. But if we agree, then we get these industry standards. And these industry standards 
uh, even sometimes just de facto standards without actually having to discuss the APIs. These just evolve and emerge as standards. So the reason why this works is if you think about APIs, typical users of a, of a, of a software that use a certain API will feel free to move from one place to another if the API is the same. Can, you, can we really imagine PyTorch, if, it, if PyTorch had like 10 different ways of doing something, would we ever imagine so many applications that just all interconnect and work together? So the way these APIs are that consensus. And as long as you can find this consensus, you can end up with a, um, you can end up with a lot of people contributing to the same goals. It represents that kind of alignment. And of course, if you can invest into an open source project with many players where other players work for you, well, that's the cheapest way to do innovation. Because all these other people who you don't pay, they work for the same goals as you have. And that's amazing. So it makes perfect business sense to in invest into one innovation, which is part of a much larger ecosystem, than to try and innovate on your own in a, in a different place. If you are able to just do one part of something that is a lot bigger, you'll be able to get more business success. And um, in addition to this, there's a lot of transformations that are really fast. If you think about like, cloud migration, cloud migration alone is very, very difficult. And if we can all get consensus on APIs, then cloud migration becomes easier. I can move from one place to another. Uh, if a service uses the same product as the open source product, then I can get the migration is easier. I can try it. I can be using it in my on-prem, then I can be moving to the cloud and so on and so forth. So um, users actually really appreciate when it's the same f or use, user interface to the software everywhere because it lets them go from one to another, it lets them reuse components, and so on and so forth. And it's just too hard to innovate when these APIs and libraries are, just, are, not, are not compatible. So the long-term value of open source is really that agreement, is the fact that we can align on something that works for everybody, and then we get the sum of things. And so when an enterprise decides, OK, I, I want agreement. I want to help contribute and innovate in software that everybody is using. In, the, in fact, I want to come and contribute and help grow an open source project. Well, um, the enterprise comes in and has a violent shock with the environment that is happening in, uh, in these open source projects. And it's, it's very simple why. These companies, you, companies usually don't like as much risk. They, don't, they, would like to con they like to control things so that there isn't that much risk. But in an open source project, you have all these other people. And they can go and run into their own direction. And so um, when these two cultures meet, they tend to disagree in many ways. But at the same time, we, uh, we want to succeed. So how do we make these two cultures that are radically different succeed in open source? Um, the, the, first, the first difference that we experience is that uh, enterprises tend to build products. And open source tends to build projects. Uh, in enterprise, I uh, favor some software that is solving a particular problem for a particular customer. And in the project, I tend to often solve uh, some interesting problem that I may have. And usually, a lot of the open source projects are born this way from somebody's desire to just, to just make something. They didn't think about how they're going to make money of it. They didn't think about the ROI. They just were tinkering with something and cre created something that was valuable. They don't have expectations of deadlines. None of these things in most of the open source projects that start at the very, very base. But slowly, this evolves. And this is, this is radically different from how we develop software inside of companies. In companies, we find a customer. We think about what the customer wants. We go and build the software for that customer, and we hope to sell the software to that customer or service. And then uh, that, that customer will want to have SLAs, will want to have contracts, and uh, so on and so forth. A good example of this clash uh, that I borrowed from somebody else is tech debt. If you think about tech debt in an enterprise, tech debt is kind of OK. If I can deliver value to a customer 
and take tech debt, the customer doesn't care. The customer just wants my software faster, their software faster. They want their solution. They want it to be solved. And so I, as an enterprise, will take on tech debt on my enterprise, and you know, the next team will fix the problem. So it's OK to compromise on that. But in open source, when you take tech debt, you're actually imposing the tech debt on the rest of the group of people who don't work with you, don't work for you at all. These people may not be OK with tech debt, because who wants to get a feature that comes with a ton of tech debt into an open source project that they will have to debug and fix later? What is it in it for them? There's nothing for them. They don't want to acquire tech debt just to get something faster. They'd like to get really high quality software that you know, improves the code base and not creates tech debt. But an enterprise is okay with it to take the shortcut and say, you know what? There's a business value to be fast. And therefore, I'm okay to take tech debt. So this is a good illustration of the difference. And I understand uh, if, you, if you don't quite feel the tech debt by working on the software, this is a European conference. And uh, you know, we Americans are okay with debt. We work with a lot of debt. And a lot of the Europeans tend to be a little bit debt averse. But a lot of things in, uh, in the US is, is, is debt based. So you can think about this as like a regional cultural problem as opposed to a different one. But the same one exists between open source software and enterprise software ar around tech debt. So uh, however, the one, there's one thing that's common. Maybe enterprises sell software, sell, sell products, want to solve customer problems, and open source is, is something different. But the one thing that is always common, it's the people. Now, actually, those are the same people. They, they all work for companies. They sometimes just wear different hats. So you, in an enterprise, I'm called you know, an engineer. Maybe I'm a, I'm a salesperson or a designer. And I'm seeking ROI for my, for my business. I'm a shareholder of the business. And then on the, uh, in the open source world, I can be a you know, maker or some inventor or something, something like that. So uh, it's very important to understand what the um, what, what motivates these people, and it's interesting because the same people are motivated by two completely different things, depending on what hat they wear. The same people are motivated by doing something interesting in technology on one side, and at the same time, they're motivated to be promoted in their companies where they work. The same people are interested in doing something for free and open source, but the same people also want to have really high ROI in the business in which they work. So. Uh, Recognizing that these are the same people, but they have sort of different motivations at different time, I think is important. And so knowing that we have very different approaches to building technology in enterprises versus open source, and that the people are actually the same, let's see how we can connect the two and get them together to build one thing, and how can they succeed together. The first thing I think is critical to doing anything between enterprise and open source is to align the business models. If your business model does not work, it's your, you will not be able to contribute successfully to the open source project. So you can't be selling software. Uh, if you are selling the actual software product that is by definition free, it's going to clash and it's not going to work. So what are examples of uh, business models that work? I think the obvious one is cloud services like the one I work for. We sell services around the software and not the software itself. People just want to pay for undifferentiated heavy lifting of launching servers, dealing with clusters, rebooting things, and scaling things with nice control plane features. So that's an obvious business model. But there's actually a lot more. Uh, I worked for an art company. And the arts company business is definitely not sell software. It's sell art. And so it actually does not care about the software that's underneath. There's no reason for it to compete uh, to build proprietary software. The proprietary software in the art company is a total liability. The more code we had, the worse it was for us. Because our business is not the software. We don't want to carry that weight. Our business is to sell artworks. And so it's a business model that's completely aligned with open source. I sell art. I do open source. That makes total sense. So, um, aligning business model is critical. However, remember that especially when you are uh, a provider of the service, well, now you've invited competition. 
And competition can take the same software and provide the same service. So that's not going to work. Your, uh, somebody, somebody else can come and provide a better service. Well, maybe your business should not exist if somebody else can provide a better service. So how do you compete over, around open source software in the business model? Well, provide a better service, maybe one that's general purpose, better service for everybody. Or specialize in a particular angle, for example, an angle, a, a good one is compliance. Companies in Germany have particular compliance needs, and so there are plenty of vendors that use the same software and that help with the issues of compliance. So you have to be confident when you go and innovate in the enterprise open source, in your enterprise in the open source software, that your business model is, is sane and that you can actually extract the value uh, for your business there by specializing in something. It has to be worth it. And one way that it's worth it for everybody is because it makes the pie simply bigger. If you think about all the capabilities that our software can create, well, maybe there is more space for everybody because there will be more adoption. More adoption will, will lead to more need of a certain specialized feature. And if my company is the expert in that angle, in that area, and confident that it can provide a better service, then I will pay this company to do, to do the work. So you have to differenti differentiate yourself without being overly protective, without creating proprietary features. Propri creating proprietary features is like the easiest way to be protective of your, uh, of your business. But there's got to be a way which is more permanent that can outlast the fact that somebody else will create the same feature. So you have to, you have to compete on your expertise and on the specialization. So the second thing, once you've decided I'm going to contribute to the open source project, I have a business model that is specialized enough that I'm confident that I can provide the better service, well, then I still have my typical corporate ways of building software. I have a customer need, and then uh, I am trying to fulfill the customer need, and I hope to get a sale at the end, and then customer support and customer success after that. But this open source thing has none of those motivations. So instead of trying to fight them, connect them. Just zigzag through this process between the two, but don't overlap them. So here's an example. I have a customer that wants something. OK, that's great. I will create a prospect in Salesforce about what the customer wants, and I will go and meet with the customer and understand their needs. And then I'll have the aha moment about understanding what, how that could look in the software, and I'll think a little bit harder, go to the open source project, and describe that feature that my customer wants in more general terms as an RFC. The nice thing about it is that somebody in open source is going to come and say, oh, this is a good general idea, but maybe we can generalize it further. Or maybe there are holes in your approach. You're trying to cut some corners, do better. So now I got free feedback from somebody else who is in that project. And I'll go back and I'll say, OK, now I understand what that feature looks like in my open source code base. I'm going to schedule my developers for my money and my enterprise to work on that software. And so I create a, a timeline, and I create an internal project, and I have all the statuses and all the reports to all the management about our progress, and that's totally fine. But my developers are going to work in the open out there. They will create issues, they will create code, and they'll commit it into this uh, open source code base, and so on and so forth. So you can see, if we just take the two processes that look nothing alike, and instead of having them clash, we just connect them and create a path that's a bit zigzags between this proprietary way of doing things, enterprise way of doing things, and open source way of doing things, then we can actually add up all these in one nice uh, sequence of events. Uh, and we can actually create some interesting opportunities. Like, for example, as soon as the feature has been committed to the code out there, I can just ask my customer to try it out. The build is available right there the next day, the next hour. Run it. And then the, the, the customer can come, my customer, my enterprise customer, can even comment on these public issues and say, this works for me, or this doesn't work for me, or here's like, Here's a repro of my bug. So it connects my developers to the customer around code, which is amazing because we shortcut the entire layer of people that are otherwise just copy-pasting things between emails. So lots of opportunities there. Uh, so being open source first in this case, contributing to an open source project, doesn't mean that you're duplicating work. It just means that 
every one of these activities needs to happen either inside or outside the company and has a value of its own. Um, in, this, in some way, we have to optimize for both groups, for people wearing these different hats. Uh, so the, um, the two, the optimizing for two different hats or two different personas can, uh, can be at odds in some, in some interesting ways. Making a customer successful could mean working on a technically easy feature, but working on a really exciting technology uh, is something that an open source developer would want to do. Right? So I have, on one hand, I can do something really quick and dirty. On the other hand, I can do some really important, complicated thing. And if I'm an open source developer, I'd like to contribute this big, complicated thing. But if I'm a company enterprise developer, I'd like to get there as fast as possible to get to my customers. So these are a little bit at odds. But there are many things and many places where they are not. A very simple example that I like is performance. It, you can be both technically complicated and super valuable for your customers. So investing in performance is uncontroversial across the board. Everybody wants faster software. And, so, and that's an externally visible feature. So uh, generally, um, the key is to try and speak the language of the people in their different situations and understand what they optimize for, earn the trust with them, and then finally understand the value that everybody is getting from, from this. Uh, there will be plenty of people in the way. And so really, the key is to understand what people want. And if they are with you, use their help. And if they're not with you, get them out of the way. And that is common between all projects, whether I work for an enterprise or not. Uh, and it's OK that people are selfish. I want to solve hard technical problems. Great. Use me in that way. I want to solve a customer problem. Great. Use me in that way. Sometimes, maybe, we can just be compatible. And together, we can build something valuable. And that's where all this, all this connection happens. And there's actually amazing ways where the two can connect. And this is a, an example that is the most corporate thing that is applied to open source. So uh, the most corporate thing is one of those uh, performance ladders or a performance benchmark. Like I, I want to write clearly how one person works versus another person versus another person. So what somebody who needs improvement at work uh, you can write those for your open source contributors as well. Someone who keeps open source work separate from their enterprise work sounds like a good idea until you look at what it looks like where someone actually engages on both the open source work and the enterprise work together. What can you do if your developer is sitting in the open source code base on behalf of your enterprise and really thinking about what's, what problems they're solving? Well. They can learn something about their, the, the customers out there in, by collaborating with others in open source, bring that information back to the business, and maybe influence business strategy of where maybe create new products out of it. So this loop can be very valuable, despite the fact that some of it is in the open and some of it is in the close. So connect the two. Uh, somebody who contributes minimal code, minimum fixes, no, that, that's, that's pretty good. But somebody who really owns, earns trust and becomes a maintainer in an open source project uh, is probably more valuable for your enterprise because they are the expert in that technology. And that is valuable for your customers as well. So you know, this is the most corporate thing. It's just a ladder or a, a performance review table. But you can absolutely write one that is com very compatible with the open source work. And so uh, similarly. There are other, way, other mechanics of working that can work in both places. Nobody really likes to duplicate code or create patches. For a very simple reason, uh, forks are expensive. And they're expensive because every time you need to catch up, well, you have to rebase to the code that's upstream. So just introduce a mechanism that prevents these forks from happening, but not because uh, of some protections or some, some rules where we want to keep those things separate but because it's just cheaper. It's just easier to do. So set those ground rules at AWS. We call them mechanisms. And it's a lot of the mechanisms with which every developer will agree, whether it's enterprise developer or it's open source developer. It's actually the same thing. The same ground rules apply. We want to reduce complexity, and we want to, uh, to remove the duplication of work. So when this, when this works, when we are really aligning 
the two ways of working, the enterprise and the open source contributions, um, we can end up with some great success. So here's some examples from OpenSearch of what success looks like when enterprises come and contribute their share of innovations in, into a product where consensus can be reached this way. Uh, the first one is from ByteDance. And uh, the team at ByteDance has stores a tremendous amount of vector data. And they have a basic problem that, you know, there's a lot of data. And uh, they wanted to reduce the amount of data that they store. They wanted to reduce the number of bytes. So they looked at the technology that was used to store the bytes and found a way to compress the data and reduce the storage by half. That's a significant innovation and technically very difficult. It solves their business need 100%. They already reused the vector search technology that was there, but they were able to bring an improvement that is purely business driven by their business, not for the greater good of the community. Of course, it has that impact, but really because it has a business need on their side. Another one is a startup that, uh, called Aaron AI that uh, is developing AI-powered ETL systems for ag frameworks. It's, it's brand new, and uh, they are, they, they found that what their customers wanted is the ability to create these pipelines across all kinds of vector stores. And so one of the, one of the features that they added to OpenSearch uh, was conversational search. And they added it to other products as well. But their customers wanted the freedom to choose all kinds of software to sto store the vectors or to do conversational AI. So they just implemented many different ones and let the customer pick, and they are the specialist in, in this technology. So they added, they added the APIs that were, that were missing. They found that OpenSearch was already a great hybrid search engine. It did text search, it did vector search. They just needed to glue a few things together, create pipelines, create workflows for, to enable conversational AI. It was this close. They were able to solve the business need for you know, a tenth of a cost that it would have been if they wanted to develop this technology from scratch. Um, Ivan is a cloud provider that focuses on being a trusted data and AI platform that's super easy to use. That's the, that's the value proposition that they sell to their customers. So of course, it's natural that Ivan is contributing easy, easy usability features. Right now, they're implementing uh, streaming APIs, stre streaming ingestion APIs, because that is a lot easier to use than batch uploads, which their customers are struggling with. Uh, a lot of data put together in batches is much harder to ingest than a stream of data. And so they're adding streaming APIs and making the product that they sell, the service that they sell, easier to use for their customers. Uh, Slack, which took over the world as a communications platform, hit about every single scale limitation you can imagine on planet Earth. And so they have a lot of write-heavy use cases. They have a lot of data that's being typed. It doesn't need to be necessarily searched, but it always needs to be stored. So naturally, they are innovating by bypassing the limitations on write. And so they are sep trying to separate, to help separate storage and compute in order to have high throughput write workloads. And that's something that they need. Um, SAP wanted to correlate logs with the rest of observability data that they collect in many dimensions. They picked OpenSearch as, the, as a generic system that was very good at uh, many observability use cases. It's a general purpose one. It's quite extensible. They liked it because it was extensible, and they needed to add open telemetry log support. That was the one feature that was missing, and so they went and just implemented it themselves. And now they defaulted to OpenSearch across the enterprise. Uber has standardized on a communication protocol, gRPC, in their, in their company because they saw overall a 20% improvement uh, in, uh, in, in performance. And so they know that they will get node-to-node -node communication improvements or ingestion improvements if they are able to introduce this protocol into open search. And it's a pretty technically complicated feat. Uh, but they, are, uh, they prefer applications in their enterprise that use protobuf by default. And so, they like open search a lot, but they'd prefer if open search used protobuf because it, it, it's easier to manage that all their services use protobuf. So they're adding protobuf to open search. It's a single innovation. 
when you add all these innovations together, that's a, that's a lot of innovations that are technically difficult coming from all kinds of companies. But together, when you add up and you look at the end result at the end of, I don't know, a year, you'll realize that so much progress has been made. And this is because everybody is working together around the same product, around the same APIs. So I'll leave you with some takeaways. When you go back to your company and decide that the cheapest way to build software is open source, keep repeating that. Don't do open source because it's good. Don't do it because it is uh, something that you think is positive. Do, so, do it because it makes complete business sense for your business. Do it because it's cheaper. It's cheaper for you, it's cheaper for your enterprise, it's cheaper for your customer, you, customers, you will be able to lower costs for your customers, you will get more customers and more business by doing so. So keep repeating that to everyone in the company. Don't try to, to say that it's better. Say it's cheaper, say it's more efficient, say it makes perfect business sense. Find a customer that has a real problem that your business can solve, where the work is in the open source code base of the project that you are contributing to. And then collaborate with that customer in this zigzag fashion. Create a project inside your enterprise, work with the customer through the open source product, engage with them out there as you contribute the code to the open source pro project or product that's, that's out there, and work with them in the, in the open to solve the business problem that you will sell to that customer. And finally, Work out all the missing parts. When somebody, something is in the way, like maybe you don't have an easy way for your developers to contribute to an open source project, to get, out, to get yourself out of the way, maybe you need to write a policy. Maybe you need an OSPO that can enable that. Maybe you just need to tell them whether they need to put their name on their GitHub profile or something like that. So figure out the missing parts that are there that are very specific to your company and are not something that is detached from your business, but really is very much about you and your enterprise. And when you add up those things and you get a muscle that keeps repeating that way, you're going to bring a tremendous amount of innovations into many open source projects. And your business will thrive by leveraging those, by selling a service that is built on top of this open source technology. And everybody else in the world will work for you as well. And you know, that, that's, good. that's just good for business. That's it. Um, I'll leave you with. A QR code, I wrote a little bit more detail about some of the story of, uh, of, of the project on, on a, some personal notes on, uh, on my blog. And uh, please ask me any questions. I think we have a few minutes. <laughs> questions? Questions? No questions? <laughs> Go ahead. Have you ever heard the argument from customers that they don't want to share, uh, say, bug reports because of internal matters, that there are business critical information in the bug reports? Yeah, so the question is, have I, have I heard from customers that don't want to share inf business critical information in bug reports? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> nobody wants to share bug reports about especially their customers. Like for example, I work at AWS and I have a customer with a problem. I am not going to put their name there or tell you what the issue is. It's customer information and customer information is critical. I, we don't share customer information. I barely have access to customer information when I look at the technical problem. So uh, I hear it all the time and it's on me, the engineer who is working with the customer to anonymize that information the best way possible. That requires a little bit of thinking. For example, the customer says, you know, I call this API, it doesn't work. I'm ingesting my super secret uh, data in there. Well, the lazy thing to do is to take the data and copy it into a bug report, right? But the less lazy thing to do is understand what they're doing, try with a, maybe a smaller subset of the data that is about, you know, movies and books, and write the automated test that reproduces the problem and I'm half where they were there to solve the bug. So the bug report that I'll put up will be a repro that is just the steps and maybe an automated test that reproduces the problem I have no idea how to fix. Uh, so I think it will, it, it's, it's on me, the, the one who sits in the middle to do it. And, and if the customer needs to file the bug report, we should ask them to, to do it as well. 
A customer that does that will be much more engaged, more likely to use the product, more likely to want to try the fix as soon as it's available, more, more likely to use the next version of the product knowing confidently that there are fixes in there. More questions? No? Is it beer time? Please one more time. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Please find me online. <laughs>